Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Dennis Waters. Dennis received his PhD from Binghamton University in 1990. He then became a publishing entrepreneur, founding technical news services like genomeweb.com. After retiring, Dennis continued his PhD research on how one-dimensional patterns of DNA, language, and code guide the three-dimensional world. He is currently a visiting scientist at Rutgers University. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you, Jim. It is a pleasure to be here. It's amazing to reconnect after God knows how many years. Dennis and I had some interactions when he was a publisher in the domain I worked in, which was, I think, Satellite Communications. Was that what your newsletter was about? I don't remember. Yeah, we were doing satellite. We were doing, uh, we were doing that. This was back in, well, I like to say this is in the mid-80s. I don't want to say it's like 35 years ago. Let's say it's the <laughs> mid-80s. Yeah, oh, we already had fire then, and we were working <laughs> on electricity, right? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we, you know, we, we, were, we were pushing the boundaries of figuring out this idea that you could send data over wireless communication, which was kind of a crazy thing at the time. Yeah. In fact, I built my second company on that idea, a company called First Call, where we yeah. we uh, managed to get error-free data over a one-way broadcast. People say, how do you do that? And uh, we came up with some very clever tricks, and it, it worked damn well. So it was amazing. I mean, I haven't talked to Dennis since and uh, happened to stumble across him. I guess it was on the SFI Facebook page. Was that where it was? Right, right. I, I, I was doing a little promotion of my, my new book, and uh, and there it was. And there you were. Yeah, and I, I said, let me take a quick look at this thing. I mean, Dennis was always a smart fella, and uh, maybe he had something interesting. Who the fuck knows, right? So I uh, took a quick look at the, at the book, and I go, holy shit, this is exactly the kind of stuff I'm interested in. So I invited Dennis onto the show. And today we're going to talk mostly about his book, which is titled Behavior in Culture in One Dimension, Sequences, Affordances, and the Evolution of Complexity. So, you know, my regular listeners know there's some Jim Rutt bait there for sure. Affordances, and evolution of complexity. The new thing here, and I got to say, I have n- never actually quite seen this approach this way, is this concept that sequences are sort of a fundamentally different thing in the world and have had a gigantic impact of the evolution of our universe. Is that kind of fair enough to say? I think that's, uh, I think that's fair, sure. The idea that, that m- most of what we see as, as complex evolution-derived behavior is, uh, is the result of, of coordination and orchestration by one-dimensional patterns. So how do you get three-dimensional behavior out of one-dimensional patterns is the is kind of the big question. Yeah, and in fact, I would actually, I would let you, next time you uh, rewrite this thing, you can be a little bit more bold and say not three-dimensional patterns, but four-dimensional patterns. Fair enough. Because the dynamics are also implied by the sequences. Oh, yes. And, and oh, yes. we obviously live in a four-dimensional space-time, and the evolution of time and space is really what it's all about. So I give yourself credit. Add, add one more dimension to. And I should add, for people who are interested in the book, this thing is amazing. Amazingly broad. It goes from biochemistry to anthropology to the evolution of language, the origin of life, and politics, and bad actors in the army, and all kinds of stuff. It's 221 pages long, but it is so full of stuff. I mean, I was just like savoring. I was reading it very, very slowly. So extremely enjoyable. And it's also, I guess your background as a journalist, it's really well written. Oh, thank you. Very, very nice. And it should also add for the uh, listeners out there, best as I can tell, it doesn't really require any prerequisites in anything. He does a very wonderful job of explaining what's needed along the way, including some fairly deep stuff. And I must note, one of my little uh, touchstones on truly interesting books is it has truly interesting footnotes. (laughs) 
<laughs> so don't skip the footnotes. It's sometimes tempting to do so, but in this case, you know, I would say each chapter is probably at least three or four of the footnotes that are actually uh, well worth reading and are very clear and really do add a fair amount to the story. Well, you know, writing a book that's as sort of relentlessly interdisciplinary as this one, you know, has all kinds of pitfalls attached to it. And, and the, the question of how much stuff you leave in the main text and how much you push down into the footnotes and, and how, as you say, to, to make a, a lot of fairly technical topics accessible to people who are not technical, or at least not technical in a particular field. So you can have somebody who may be a linguist, but doesn't know anything about molecular genetics, read the book, and you've got to make it accessible to them. But then you've got somebody who's a molecular geneticist, read the book, who doesn't maybe know that much about linguistics. So you've got to make the linguistic part accessible to them. So it's it's a challenge. And, and as I went along, more and more stuff got pushed into the footnotes. So there you have it. Yeah. And before we jump in, let's talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the difficulty the institutional difficulty of interdisciplinary research. You know, you quote uh, David Hall. Officially, we're all supposed to value interdisciplinary research, but in reality, just about every feature of academia frustrates genuinely interdisciplinary work. Those of us who are engaged in it are the last hired and the first fired. Well, that's David Hall, who was uh, one of the great uh, philosophers of biology and one of the great inspirations for this work. But but the, the problem with interdisciplinary work in the academy, I think, has been well stated by him in the sense that, that as you well know, the academy is pretty well siloed. And it's difficult for people to break out of the silos, despite the good intentions of faculty, administrators, and that kind of thing. I had the luxury, A, of, of being in a fairly eclectic department when I was pursuing my PhD, and I had a PhD advisor who was uh, wide open to this kind of thing. And also because, you know, I've been uh, an independent scholar, as we're called, as opposed to having a, you know, a, a, an academic affiliation for the past uh, several decades, it's given me a little more freedom to do this kind of thing. So I, I, I'm not sure even I could have done it if I were, if I were in an academic setting. Yeah, it would have been damn difficult. In fact, uh, I think in retrospect, if there had been more room for interdisciplinary research, I might have actually gone forward and, and done graduate school like I originally intended to. But I, as I got to learn, I came from a working class background, didn't really know very many college educated people other than school teachers. So when I got into college and kind of thought, what the hell? This is what these people do? Fuck that, right? <laughs> then late in life, I kind of reconnected with my academic interest at the Santa Fe Institute, which is uh, kind of relentlessly cross-disciplinary, even transdisciplinary. You know, such a uh, approach to research had existed in 1975, I think I definitely would have hopped into it. So there's bits of it out there, but not as much as people wish there was, because I'm you know, involved sure. in science governance on various boards and stuff. And they all talk about it, but they don't do it nearly as much as they talk about it. So you were very, very fortunate to have found a advisor who lets you get away with this, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's get into it. The first item in the book that I highlighted is a really interesting thought. And then in some sense, this is like the biggest thought in the whole thing is that on Earth before life, let's say as far as we know, in the universe before life, there were no sequences at least not sequences in the sense that you're talking about. Well, the you know if you think about the uh, the prebiotic Earth, or really sort of any of I mean, there's they've now thousands and thousands of exoplanets have been discovered, and that's probably the case on 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 many of those. But in the the prebiotic Earth, you know, there was a lot going on, but most everything that was going on is is stuff that we would recognize as being geochemistry and stuff that was that was obeying physical law. And explaining what was going on was not that difficult because, you know, although there was a lot of complexity and if you really wanted to measure it and, you know, model it and all that kind of stuff, it would, it would be, it would be difficult. But the stuff that was going on was readily understandable in terms of geophysics and that kind of thing. But then, you know, if you, if you, if you turn around and look at what we have today, we're, we're in this environment. It's a cultural environment and a social environment and a technological environment of humans uh, and also a natural environment. Just about everything that we're looking at, there are the, the trees, the grass, the birds, the, you know, the squirrels, the lichens. All of it is being orchestrated in a, to some extent by, uh, by sequences, sequences of DNA and RNA and protein in the case of the living world and sequences of, of speech and of text. 
and of computer code zeros and ones in our you know technological civilization so this is this is the big change i think that has taken place since the prebiotic earth is we have become sequentialized the surface of the earth has been taken over and colonized by sequences and to understand how matter behaves under the influence of sequences is not the same as understanding how matter behaves under the laws of physics. Yeah, I think this is very, very useful. It actually, it's actually uh, helps buttress an argument that I occasionally make at SFI, which uh, I would say that the line between life and non-life is a fairly bright line that is qualitatively different. I get a lot of pushback on that. I think that your argument about sequences actually helps buttress that argument that uh, a world that doesn't operate from sequences with some of the capabilities that you, that we'll start to talk about is a different way. Uh, you know, the, the, the behaviors are different. Statistics are different. Everything is different. This was really a fundamental qualitative change in the evolution of the universe. Yeah, and the I think the you know there, there's there's right now in 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 the in the in the current moment there's a huge amount of discussion about UFOs and space aliens and all that sort of thing has come back into the public consciousness in a way that it's been absent for for a while and all, all the stuff that I'm hearing and reading and thinking about I mean what always comes to mind is you know well where are the sequences what kind of sequences are there that are orchestrating this because these kinds of things that must obey the laws of physics, but we know that the laws of physics can be bent and constrained by sequences to uh, create complex behavior. So if we want to, you know, I don't know if there are aliens, and I'm not even going to speculate on that, but if there were, I bet they have sequences, and I would bet that they uh, that they are the result of a process of uh, natural selection just like we are. Yeah, and that's a good framing, because you point out that this idea of sequences in no way suspends the laws of physics, essentially. These are uh, constraints that sit on top of the laws of physics, which is a very interesting concept. And you also make the point that uh, these constraints are not causal. Rather, they tend to be probabilistic. Maybe you could talk about that concept a little bit. Well, this goes back to uh, to Leibniz, actually, who who talked about things that that incline but do not necessitate. So, you know, when you when you think of physics, you're really thinking about things that are either certain or impossible. So everything is either certain, it's going to happen, or impossible, it's not going to happen. But our world, the world that we live in, and the living world from which we arose sort of lives in between those two places. We have things that are not almost certain, but not quite, and things that are almost impossible, but not quite. So the need for understanding constraints as a way of harnessing or orchestrating or choreographing the way the physical law works is, is what we're after here. Uh, the The Language and sequences of DNA in the in the cell operate as boundary conditions on the behavior of the underlying matter. It's interesting. Actually, it's a very uh, congruent concept with Brian Arthur's uh, ideas about technology. In fact, I'm going to be interviewing him in about two weeks on my last episode this month on his book, The Nature of Technology. And he fundamentally talks about technology being a container for phenomena. And by phenomena, he means physical law. You know, for instance, the fact that we use uh, quantum mechanical effects to read the surface of uh, high density disk drives, for instance, it's a, a whole series of constraints and structures built on top of a physical phenomena. I think the two ideas are pretty similar. I'm going to have to think about that. But now let's try to draw a picture of what you mean by sequences. You know, you basically just early on say there are really two different ways of thinking about them. One is instructive sequences and the other is descriptive sequences. An instructive sequence, a recipe, how to, how to bake a pie is one of the, uh, one of the ones that you use uh, several times. How to assemble Ikea furniture or how to set up a tent. What more do you want to say about instructive sequences? Well, I think the thing that's interesting about the distinction between what you describe and what you instruct is is there is also a distinction here between, and, and we'll get into this more, I'm sure, a little later, things that are, when you make a description, that description is relatively static. When you're creating an instruction, you really want to control the behavior of matter, even if that matter is somebody's dad setting up a tent. So the instructive sequences 
uh, tell you what to do. They, they give you a way of organizing the world. It may be just putting together furniture. It may be making a pie. Descriptive sequences are really the result of some kind of a perception or a measurement process in which you see something in the world and then you, you write down uh, typically what it is that you saw. The thing that's interesting about, about language and about all of these sequences is that one sequence can do both of these things. Now that should, that's in a way that sounds sort of you know, trivial and obvious, but it's actually quite profound. The fact that you can describe and you can instruct, that is, you can, you can make a measurement and you can also, you know, choreograph some behavior in the three-dimensional world with the same, the same sequence, the same, the same alphabet, the same syntax and so forth. Yeah, that's quite interesting. The uh, kind of the dual uh, attributes of things like language. Another component that you specify for your sequence is the idea that they're discrete versus continuous. You know, the 3D world is continuous. Sequences are discrete. Well, there's a there's you know a huge literature on the, on the discrete versus the continuous in in the engineering and computer science and so forth and mathematics absolutely, but in this case it's really talking about things like in a in a sequence, the only fundamental relationship between two let's say letters of the alphabet for the sake of simplicity is adjacency. That is, they're adjacent to one another. The physical distance between them, the physical attractions between them are not really what's important. In other words, you've got a couple of letters on a page, and it's really the fact that it's those letters and they're next to each other. That is, they create a certain pattern through adjacency that is important. The physical aspects of them, what kind of paper they're printed on and what kind of ink it is and what the shape of the font is and those sorts of things are not are not as important. So the, the kinds of things that we would normally talk about when we talk about the relationships between objects in the physical world are going to be physical forces. There's going to be gravity and electromagnetism and that kind of thing. And what are the what are those relationships? And with sequences, it's really this question of adjacency: what follows what. Yep. And then another attribute, very important and seems to be characteristic of all the ones you talk about, is that there's a kind of two level phenomena going on. There's a base level alphabet, if we want to call it that, and then there's relationships amongst these elements that produce patterns. Well, yeah, the, uh, the, this, is, this is well known in, in linguistics, and, and it's, uh, it was, I think, originally described by uh, Charles Hockett, who was a linguist at, uh, at Cornell. <laughs> There's a lot of Cornell connections through all of this for some reason. Anyway, he called it duality of patterning. In other words, you start at some fundamental level with meaningless elements, in this case, letters of an alphabet, and then you combine them, and you sort of build a hierarchy you know, you have uh, you have words and morphemes, and you have phrases and clauses and sentences and so forth, and you just build up, build up, and and you start out with things that have no meaning, and yet as you as you build this hierarchy, they gradually begin to uh, begin to accrue meaning, and the same thing is true in the cell because the the nucleotides that make up uh, DNA, if you just take them at what they are, they're just molecules. But if you arrange them, then uh, you start uh, start putting together arrangements three at a time. These are the codons that map to amino acids in the genetic code. And then you can organize them beyond that into things like genes and then the, the segments of genes that, uh, that take place in split genes and alternative splicing and that stuff. So we may get into that too. Yeah. And then another fundamental attribute that yeah, you attribute to these sequences, and I'd never thought about this before, but this is uh, seems key actually, is that they are low energy relative to the consequences that they trigger. Well, if you think about a switch, a switch is a is a good example of this. In other words, the amount of energy that it takes. So, what's a good switch? Uh, the, the trigger of a shotgun is a good switch. The amount of energy that it takes to to pull the trigger is very different from the amount of energy that is released by that act. And and sequences have this have this property in that they they really their energy level is trivial compared to what they can constrain and what they can guide. I mean, we have 
we have a lot of idioms on our language that relate to this. You know, actions speak louder than words, and sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. All of these are implying that 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 the sequences themselves are largely inert. It's really the physical world that's uh, that's at issue. Yeah, my favorite one of those linguistics is talk is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, very true. Now, this is this next point is key, and I think this is it's so deep in one of the areas that I do some of my own work in, which is that any sequence is only meaningful to the degree that it has an interpreter, right? In fact, as you say in the book, the preexistence of a complete set of these mechanisms is a requirement for sequences to express their functions and replicate their patterns. We inherit not only genes made of DNA, but an intricate structure of cellular machinery made up of proteins. So there's this very curious requirement for the coevolution of interpreters and sequences. If, you know, if the human species were completely wiped out, we would, um, all of our, all of our books would remain in existence as physical objects and they would, you know, they would gradually disintegrate, but what they're able to, the utility that they have or their ability to, uh, to act as boundary conditions on anything going on in the real world would, would go away when we went away. And the same is true in, in the living world. When, when, when you're taught about the reproduction of a cell and you're talking about the replication of DNA and, and mitosis and processes like that, there's a great emphasis on the sequence. And yeah, I got to have the sequence, that's for sure. But you also need all of the interpretive molecules, which are a remarkable remarkable collection of very large and very strange things that can actually uh, transcribe and translate the, uh, the sequence in DNA into a functioning protein, for example, or that can replicate a DNA sequence into another DNA sequence. So, so both of these, you, you need both the sequence and you need the interpretive machinery. And, uh, and if all you have to do is pass on the sequence, then you're kind of stuck. I mean, this is the way viruses work, as I'm sure you know, the, the, the virus is really just a bit of pretty much naked DNA or RNA, it doesn't have any of that equipment. And that's why it has to attach itself to a cell and use the equipment that's in the cell, the molecular machinery of the cell itself, in order to express it and, and replicate. And of course, that's why epigenetics is interesting, right? If you had some DNA that had been stored in a test tube, uh, it wouldn't do anything, right? It requires all the machinery, all the chemistry of the cell, uh, which is replicated when each cell divides. So the chemical state of the cell itself has some impact on how genes are expressed and how uh, development occurs. So the machinery and the instructions are kind of, especially in biology, are intimately interconnected. And you, you alluded to a little bit the Fermi paradox, which listeners to the show know is one of my pet obsessions. I believe it is like the second most important scientific question. The most important scientific question is why does the universe exist? And we're not even close to the pay grade of being able to answer that one. But the second one, are there others out there? We may be getting close to being able to answer that one. And, you know, when I was a 12 year old nerd, I was sure the answer was, oh yeah, definitely they're out there. Got to be hundreds of thousands of smart ones. I mean, just where did Heinlein get all of his ideas, right? It had to be, uh, had to be based on something. But the more I thought about it, it's possible we're alone. And it might be this issue of bootstrapping the interpreter and the sequence, uh, particularly the DNA one. You know, my home academic field is evolutionary computing. And one of the things that we talk about in evolutionary computing a lot is something called the error catastrophe. I think you call it the error threshold in your book, which is if the error rates above X, and typically, and at least in a controlled experiment, it's a fairly brisk transition. When the error rate's too high, the ability to build very much up from evolution is very, very weak. As you build things up, the mutations break it down again. You get past the error catastrophe, and what you build up partially gets destroyed by mutation, but enough of it gets preserved that you have an upward cycle. And one of the great mysteries of the origins of life is how in the world did a series of chemistry, which almost certainly was above the error catastrophe and its mutation rate, manage to evolve this very elaborate machinery around DNA, which does error checking and repair, et cetera, so that the replication of DNA is like in error rates of a part per billion rather than more typically parts per thousand or parts per million that you'll see in even the best uh, chemical 
synthesis? Well, that is a great question. Give me a call when you figure it out. Yeah, now that, that one's way past my pay grade. But <laughs> actually, uh, Stuart Kaufman and I had an amazing conversation uh, about four hours one time, and we both we came to that point as the big, you know, hmm, you know, that's that just imponderable how we could have got there, and it might have been such low probability that it never happened anywhere else in the universe. Well, I, I, you know, I might quarrel with that just a little bit because I think that one of the things that you can take away from this book, and you know, part of the joy of an inter disciplinary book is is figuring out how it docks into all these fields so it's like there are docking stations in in a, in a lot of different fields that this thing that this approach to to sequences will uh, will uh, will dock into and you know an astrobiology i think is one an astrobiology is is plagued and has been plagued by kind of what what you've been talking about there what's what's the 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 n equals 1 problem which is that we only have one example of life and it's very difficult to extrapolate what the necessary and sufficient conditions are for life based on one example. However, I think that the, uh, the, the point that the book makes is that actually sequences of language, of speech, and later of text, and, and ultimately of, of code, are a second system that operate on the same principles as the same. They're complete, they're different in many ways, but they are two examples of the same kind of thing, a system of sequences. So that, that ratchets us from N equals one up to N equals two. And when you've got N equals two, it's much easier to triangulate what the uh, necessary and sufficient conditions might be. And I mean, if, we, if, we've, if we've hit the jackpot twice on earth, what does that tell us about the odds of someone maybe hitting the jackpot at least once somewhere else? Yeah, I did read that in the book, and I have to say I was not convinced <laughs> uh, because the problems are at such different scales, right? You know, the, uh, the the DNA bootstrap problem is at the level of the you know transition from chemistry to life, uh, while the linguistic transition is way, way up the stack. Life had gone a very, very, very long way before we got to the point of even proto language like your vervet monkey example. Well, if you if you get uh, if you get people studying the origin of life and people studying the origin of language in the room together, they'll have a nice argument about whose problem is harder. <laughs> uh, that's true. And we have uh, both groups at the Santa Fe Institute, mm -hmm. Eric Smith and uh, Harold Morowitz, now rest in peace, one of my mentors, uh, both done some very interesting work on origin of life and Murray Gelman of all people uh, yeah, that's late right. in his life was he had uh, a book on that. I think SFI published that, right? Yeah, and he's yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, it was his passion. You know, here's one of the smartest guys ever and worked on it, didn't solve it. So yeah, both really, and Eric Smith, one of the smartest people I've ever met, neither of them have solved it yet. Two very, very difficult uh, problems. Another interesting attribute of your sequences, and this is one, again, I never thought about, but it has to be approximately true, is that all sequences of similar length have similar energetic costs which actually turned out to be quite important. Well, yeah, if you uh, whether you're whether you're replicating a sequence of DNA or interpreting a, a, a sequence of DNA or you're copying a, a, a text or you're uh, copying a, a sequence of code, if sequences of the same length had different energy profiles, then an evolutionary process would tend to work against the ones that uh, that were more energetically complex. So it's it's really crucial that the that the interpretive machinery, as we've been discussing, the interpretive and replicative machinery, uh, be able to handle anything that's thrown at it. And so there is not a necessity of 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 even being semantically coherent. So if you've got a photocopier, for example, as one way of, 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 of replicating a text, um, the photocopier will, will replicate nonsense text as easily as it will very sensible text. So, so, the, uh, so that's, a, that's a key thing is you've got to be able to have the, the machinery of translation uh, operate on any, any sequence that is thrown at it. Yeah. And that has some interesting implications at the higher level, particularly in the social level. A distinction that we make in economics is that between rivalrous and non-rivalrous. Mm -hmm. You know, the classic example is a ham sandwich is a rivalrous good. Either I eat it or you eat it. We can't both eat it. But when the cost to duplicate something is essentially trivial relative to its value, 
we can say it's non-rivalrous. You know, the classic example, the MP3 file. It's not quite free to duplicate, but effectively free because it's so low cost relative to its potential value. And so the fact that these things have similar and low energetic costs, these sequences, tells us something fundamental about the difference between material goods and intellectual property, for instance. And perhaps we've gotten ourselves into a conundrum trying to make one like the other when maybe they shouldn't be. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. I mean, I think the, you know, the real distinction here boils down to this distinction between, and this this is, again, the work of my uh, my advisor upon whose foundation I, uh, I've, I've built a lot of this. Who His name is Howard Patti. He was actually uh, a colleague of Stuart Kaufman's uh, back in the late 60s. There was a series of conferences funded by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, on sort of theoretical biology that was uh, organized by C.H. Waddington. And uh, they had four of these things, They you know, four volumes of that came out, but a, but a, a very young Stuart Kaufman and a very young Howard Patti were, were among the uh, among the junior faculty at, the, at that thing way back when. Those volumes are still quite fascinating to read. I would, I would recommend them. But anyway, um, Howard Patti came up with this distinction between what he calls uh, rate independence and, and rate dependence that sequences are rate independent because the amount of time that is necessary to process the sequences is not is not as material as it is in rate dependent systems like the ordinary physical world and the, my favorite example of this is is when you take a driving test and you usually take a written test to test your knowledge of the rules of the road. And then, and then you take a, a driving test that actually puts you behind the wheel with an inspector who, who makes sure that you, can, that you can physically operate an automobile. And if you imagine a situation in which, let's say, the, te- the overall test takes an hour, you can finish the written test. If, if you've got 30 minutes allotted for it, you can finish the written test in 10 or 15 minutes and still get everything right. So the speed at which you take the test doesn't have any influence on the on the outcome. You can be the you can take all 30 minutes and get it wrong, or you can take 10 minutes and get it right. However, if you try to do the uh, if 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 the driving test has 30 minutes allocated for it and you finish it in 15, you're in big trouble. Yeah, you gave some other good examples of this distinction between rate independence and rate dependence. Apologize to the 50% of my audience, which is not in the United States, but the football huddle, I think you describe as one where uh, (laughs) whether it takes five seconds or 25 seconds to call the play doesn't really matter. It's not time dependent how long it takes the quarterback to describe the play. But the details of the motion of the players are all very rate dependent. You know, the famous relationship between the running back and the lineman. Do you hit the hole at the right time, right? As a former offensive lineman, you know, I remember very well that you had, it was fractions of a second. If you could apply your block at the right time, the guy got through. Even if you had a good block, if it was too early or too late, it was irrelevant. And the other one, which I thought was very good, because it's an interest of mine, is the distinction between negotiations prior to a war and war itself. Yes, the uh, this 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 concept of of rate dependence and rate independence scales all the way up to uh, international affairs, and there are basically two ways that that nation states have to resolve their disputes. One is to negotiate a treaty, and the other is to go to war. And negotiating a treaty is a rate independent process because it doesn't really matter how long the treaty is or how long it takes to negotiate the treaty. These are not the important things. It's what the treaty actually says that's uh, that's crucial. On the other hand, warfare is a completely rate dependent process in which you know small changes of rate at certain times can have tremendous effect on the outcome. So so it's a it's really a fundamental concept when you think about anything that is sequence based like a treaty for example. Yeah and, and you know let's take you know just to make it tangible for the audience you know imagine the battle of britain do the RAF fighters get there before the bombers or not you're talking 5 minute difference right yeah. and uh, london gets clobbered if they don't whole bunch of German bombers get shot down if they do. So rate dependence is of the essence of the actual war itself. There's a great distinction, one I'd never thought about before again. So I love about this book. There's so many things that when you think about them, you go, yeah, that has to be right. But just never thought about them before. So that's what I love about this book, why I just think it's so cool. 
Another one of uh, Howard Petit's ideas, uh, which is really quite interesting, is his distinction between laws and rules. Well, here here we're getting into uh, it, 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 just to to make sure that we're clear on what we mean by a law. We're really talking about something like a physical law. Uh, we you know we have we have laws that are created by legislatures, the law of the land, but that's not the kind of law we're talking about here. We're really talking about about physical law, and this ties back to some of the uh, observations that were made. Gosh, it must have been in the late '40s by uh, by Max Delbruck, the uh, physicist. He he had a paper called "A Physicist Looks at Biology." And, and he was one of the first to, to sort of make this explicit. But the idea is that a law, like a physical law, has, has three characteristics. Uh, first of all, it is uh, universal. We expect that that law, if there is a law of physics like gravity or electromagnetism, that that law is going to hold everywhere and at all times. It is inexorable in the sense that there's no way to stop it. It's going to do what it's going to do. And, uh, and finally, it is incorporeal. And while, you know, you may say that the earth, you know, revolves around the sun, it, it does so without having any mechanism to make that possible. It just goes ahead and, and, and does it. On the other hand, rules, which I map onto the idea of a sequence, rules are not universal. They're local. That is, the, the rules that operate the living world and that operate our civilization are local to this planet. We would not expect to go to to Mars and find a Finnish being spoken there, but we would expect the law of gravity to work there, for example. So, so rules are, are local. They are contingent in the sense that they are not inexorable. They can always be evaded or changed. The, you, can, you can amend the Constitution to prohibit alcohol consumption, but then you can immediately turn around and negate that that constitutional amendment. So uh, a, a rule can always be changed. And then a rule is always structure dependent. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier, Jim, that, that you need this set of mechanisms in order to execute some kind of a rule. So a rule takes the form of a sequence. It's always going to be local. It's always going to be structure dependent. And it's always going to be contingent in some sense in a way that the laws of nature are not. The, the laws of nature are universal, inexorable, and incorporeal. And, uh, you know, this idea that the rules are bootstrapped with their interpreters, again, is very key to me, right? Think of it at the high level, the concept of nation state rules, which we call laws to make it confusing, but let's distinguish that in Dennis's sense, those are rules, uh, are meaningless without something like the state, right? The state is this many leveled stack of emergent complexity, which interprets the rules and turns them into actions, essentially. And the uh, statutes without the state are meaningless. Frankly, the other way around is more or less true, too. The state without something like statutes is sort of meaningless as well. So then that's the fundamental distinction with this concept of laws. I love the idea that nobody is pushing the earth around the sun. It's a, it's sort of a fundamental of the universe. You know, we, we, we now think we know, at least, that it's due to the you know, distortion in space-time, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, but that's a, essentially a brute fact about the universe, at least at our, at our current level of understanding, though we're not complete in our understanding of that yet because right. we have not unified general relativity with quantum mechanics. And so there may still be some surprises there, but we at least have a, a reasonable first-order view of the nature of the physical law that causes that to happen. I thought that was very interesting. Now let's move on to the next, and SFI-style complexity science finds this an extraordinarily important attribute of what you call sequences, which is their self-referentialness. Well, that's one of the things that's uh, most interesting about sequences is that sequences can refer to other sequences. But they do so. They do so in a in a sort of interesting physical way. If if you're uh, and you know a footnote would be a good example of that. In other words, a footnote takes one sequence that's somewhere in the text, and then it refers you to another sequence that's somewhere else in the text. And that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of self referential property that that allows this complexity to to build. And the thing that's key to that, I think, is uh, is the need for stability. If you're going to refer to something, that something has got to be stable. If you think about uh, Odysseus in the in Homer, you know, being 
tied to the mast so that he can hear the songs of the sirens without uh, without being tempted to jump overboard and get himself killed. And so, so he orders his sailors to tie him to the mast, and then he tells them, and no matter what I say, ignore what I say in the future. So he's basically saying, I'm ordering you to ignore certain orders that I'm going to say in the future. And that is a kind of self-reference. So, so he's essentially using, using one sequence to negate the effects of another sequence. Now, the thing is that, 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 that is, um, that's a very simple example and it's an example that's based in that's based in speech. So this is something he says. These are not written instructions. These are verbal instructions. And we all know that verbal instructions are quite open to misinterpretation and misunderstanding. And we all have had conversations with people, and we go back, uh, you know, and say, "Well, I remember when you told me this." And it's like, "Well, I didn't tell you that. You told me this. No, I didn't tell you that." So, so the kind of of self reference that uh, that's needed in order to uh, to build a complex system requires text. It requires a stable sequence. We know that uh, speech is uh, speech is evanescent. It kind of uh, disappears after you after you say it. So very simple things like Odysseus being tied to the mast, he can tell his sailors a couple of things, and they'll be able to remember it and probably get it. But if he said, on the other hand, if this happens, then you untie me, and if this happens, then you don't untie me, and if this happens, the ship, you know, if he starts making it too complicated, people aren't going to be able to remember it. But if it's written down and the sequence that is being searched is is stable which you get both with text and with with DNA in the cell, then you're able to really build unlimited evolutionary complexity. Well, let me spring that. I have it actually later in my notes, but let's spring the second idea of uh, Dennis's, which is that, you know, in the history of uh, civilization and history of how humans are different than chimpanzees, et cetera, we talk about language as the bright line that separates humans from chimps. And at some level, it probably is at least something like Chomsky and fully recursive language. But Dennis makes this very interesting claim. And as I said, later in my notes, let's talk about it now, that language is important, but actually it's writing that's more important for the world we have today. Why don't you? Uh... Yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, th- there are, there are people who have been working in this field and I think they have been overlooked to some extent. I mean, there's a, a psychologist in Canada called David Olson, who's done a lot of this work. And of course the anthropologist Jack Goody, uh, who died a few years ago was also, uh, uh, very active in understanding the implications of writing or the difference between between literate cultures and uh, and and preliterate cultures, but but I I start the story really in uh, in the book at the beginning of life. Uh, there's a there's a pretty strong consensus now of, among uh, molecular biologists who study this sort of thing that there that there was once something called an RNA world, and an RNA world was uh, based not on DNA and protein the way our current living world is, but was based on RNA molecules. And RNA molecules had the, the, uh, the property of being able to fold themselves up into, into enzymes, which are called ribozymes. The RNA uh, ribozymes could then go out and, and execute functions in metabolism and get a, you know, probably get a primitive metabolism uh, going, but then they had to unfold themselves in order to be replicated. So that you could replicate the RNA, but you could only replicate it when it was not folded. And the RNA could do stuff in metabolism as a ribozyme, but it could only do that when it folded up on itself. So you had these kind of two states of things, and it was uh, it was really difficult. And, and and RNA has a lot of the other things that you were talking about earlier, Jim, about uh, about error catastrophes and that kind of thing. That it, it, it was it, it was very unstable. It tended to uh, have a high error rate when you replicate it. That kind of thing. So the RNA world, there's a lot of evidence that the RNA world was there. 
if you think of a couple of the large molecular complexes that are that are important part of the cellular machinery, you've got the ribosome, which is what uh, what uh, translates messenger RNA into protein. You've got the spliceosome, which is the thing that that actually edits on the fly the uh, the messenger RNA. And these things are huge molecules. I mean, enormous molecules. And at the very heart of them, they have RNA mechanisms. So, in other words, the 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 ancestral mechanism that is doing all the work is actually made of RNA and all this protein that's in these things is sort of building built around that to, to provide some uh, some superstructure and kind of hold things together. In any event, there, there's lots of evidence that this RNA world existed, but there's uh, plenty of evidence too that it could not have gotten very complicated. Uh, because of the fact that it had a high error rate and the, the, the catalytic power of these ribozymes was not very strong and that you really needed to add DNA, which was far more stable, use DNA for information storage, and then you develop protein enzymes, which are far more powerful catalytically. So essentially, you get a division of labor in which the information storage and the replication is handled by one set of molecules, which are DNA, and then the, uh, the interaction with the, uh, with the world is taken care of by these protein. Now, how you get from one to the other, nobody knows the answer to that. But I think that model actually works very well when we start to think about human culture, because human culture in a pre-literate society, the only thing you had to go on really was, was, was fallible human memory. If you wanted to know something, you would have to ask someone who you think might know the answer to that question. If you want to know whether a plant is edible or whether, uh, you know, whether the stream runs to the sea, things like this, you need to find somebody who, who knows the answer to that question. So it was really the pre-literate cultures. And, and you know, pre-literate cultures got pretty far. You know, there were states, there were, um, you know, technologies, there were lots of things going on. But the real key to moving into our literate technological civilization was the advent of writing. Because what writing did is writing allowed the stability to uh, enter so that instead of having evanescent speech, you could have written instructions. And, and once you've got writing in place, then this kind of self-referential process can, can scale more or less indefinitely and you develop some complexity. The other thing that you need, so you, so in the same way that RNA gave way to DNA as a more stable storage medium, speech gave way to text as a more stable storage medium. The other side of the equation here is that just as RNA ribozymes gave way to much more powerful and potent protein enzymes. So did we in develop these uh, technologies of, of measurement and of, uh, of creating machines that could behave in the world in a way that our, that our physical bodies could not do. So we could extend our perceptual systems, our vision and our hearing and so forth, and we can extend the power of our hand through machinery and, and, and that kind of thing. So, so it's a combination of being able to have much more powerful interaction with the environment and also have much more stable uh, information storage in the form of writing. And I think that's really where the, where the threshold was that was crossed going from a, a sort of preliterate society to the modern technological civilization that we have. And I think this, this goes back to the work of John von Neumann in his, uh, his theory of self-reproducing automata, where he talked about some threshold, some tipping point, after which you can get an enormous increase in complexity, but before which you, you, you don't get that. And I think, that's, I think that's what we're looking at here. Yeah. And von Neumann, old Johnny von Neumann, I believe, argued that you needed to separate the information layer from the production layer, essentially, right? The physical layer, the reproductive layer. Yeah, there are there are uh, there is a necessity to separate the replication function from the interpretive function, uh, and that is why when he when he built his his mental model of of what a self reproducing automaton would look like. Uh, he had one component where you would feed a sequence into that, and it would it would build a machine from that sequence. But he also had a second 
part that uh, you would feed the sequence in and it would make a copy of the sequence. So decisively separating the copying from the interpretation was uh, was crucial. And we find that to be to be uh, the case in the living world as well. Yeah, it's interesting. You, uh, you make a very interesting parallel in that you compare and contrast within the DNA sequences between structural and regulatory and the white collar versus blue collar work in a corporation. So molecular biologists uh, tend to look at genes, you know, broadly speaking, as either being structural genes, which, which, which code for proteins that actually go out and do things in the cell. So these are the proteins that guide metabolism and, uh, and so on and so forth. So they're the, the sort of front line. And I, I think of them as, as blue collar. These are the blue collar enzymes or the blue collar genes that code for these enzymes. But most of the complexity that we get in the world really comes from the regulatory apparatus, which which goes back to this question of, of, of self-reference that we were talking about a, a bit ago. And there are other genes that, that have no function except to regulate or control the expression of the blue collar genes. And I think of them as being the white collar genes and, and white collar enzymes. So the thing about them, of course, is that you can start building hierarchies and scaling those things up so that one gene can regulate another gene, but then something else can regulate the first one and so on and so forth. And you can build fairly complicated uh, modules by doing that, what are called gene regulatory networks by uh, molecular biologists. And it's, it doesn't require, if you said this or it was a thought I had myself, but anyway, it certainly fits into this idea. And that's one could think of them as almost two separate worlds, particularly let's look at the white collar world. Right. We have old Joe sitting on the assembly line, tightening bolt number 47. And let's say the corporate culture within the white collar world, toxic versus friendly versus supportive or not, actually has no implications whatsoever on old Joe and and, uh, turning bolt 47, unless the particular affordance, which moves from the white collar to the blue collar, tells Joe to stop tightening uh, bolt 47 or to use some different tool. So in some sense, they're two different domains and it's the affordances between the two that produce the result and effect. Yes, that's right. Any system of sequences has a part that that faces the world and interacts with the world. But then those those interactors, blue collar interactors, uh, are then constrained by other interactors that are purely white collars. And you can just add layer upon layer of abstraction till you get up to uh, to the point where you lose, completely lose track of, 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 of what the meaning of some of these things are. I mean, we see that in vocabulary. We have, uh, we have abstract nouns. We have things like freedom. And we know that freedom and uh, and loyalty and dignity and things like that are very high level. And we also have things like rocks and uh, conveyor belts and uh, so forth. So we have things that are fairly low level that 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 are more physical and 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 which we understand more directly and can perceive more directly. And what we're really looking at with things like freedom, uh, words like that, is that they are able to constrain and guide enormous amounts of underlying activity by by you know the blue collar interactors that they're uh, that are out there so when we think of when we think of freedom uh, well here's a good example this this is actually not from language this is from from the cell so I have a, I have a son who is developmentally disabled and he has a condition that is called fragile X syndrome he, he lacks a single gene that produces a single protein, but the downstream effects of that protein are quite extraordinary. There are literally hundreds of reactions that this protein uh, helps to regulate, and uh, there are, there are uh, phenotypical results from this. But it's 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 how is it possible, for example, that you know the, the typical phenotype phenotype for a fragile X male is to have big ears. Uh, high palate, large testicles, communication difficulties, cognitive processing, lots of things, very loose joints. How is it possible that the absence of one gene 
can have all of this amazing amount of effects. And that's because it sits at the very top of a hierarchy. It's a very high level white collar gene that is affecting downstream the, uh, the interpretation of all of these other genes. And the, uh, the case in language is that you have words like, like freedom and, uh, and you know that that word can, you know, in the right context can unleash a cascade of all kinds of, uh, all kinds of real world activities. So these abstract words are there. And, and the thing, to go back to something we were talking about earlier, Jim, the, the, the thing that's interesting here is that, again, the interpretive system, the interpretive machinery has to be able to handle a word like freedom as easily as it does a word like rock. So something that's extremely tangible, something that's extremely abstract, the processing equipment doesn't doesn't care. It, it, it just takes care of it. Well, this is a, a very interesting, pivotal point in the conversation because it actually points to two different, very important concepts. I'm trying to decide which one to go to first. Okay, let's do open-endedness first, which is because hierarchies can keep hierarchicking, you know, as well as mutate, et cetera. But just, let's just assume that the continually building of hierarchies, new concepts are always available, at least in principle, to be built. And this is something new and different. You know, new physical laws, as far as we know, are not invented, right? Uh, though there is some fringe theories about the evolution of physical law, but let's assume we'll take it as taught in our physics textbooks that they're fixed. These, uh, particularly the white collar systems, and then of course their affordances to the blue collar world are open-ended in that more and more levels of abstraction can be added. That's right. You can't, there's, there's no upper limit on how abstract and, and, and uh, the, these hierarchical stacks can become. One of the things that I've always found fascinating about language is, is that you do have have these these kinds of words like nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs which are pretty much open classes they're called open classes which is to say that you can coin new a new noun you can name new things and and this is done all the time in science and engineering and product development that you come up with something and you give it a name or you come up with some new activity and you give that a name so 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 coining new new words for nouns for adjectives for uh, for adverbs and for verbs is very uh, is is very straightforward we do it all the time and nobody thinks twice about it but there's also these other words things like prepositions and things like dictics which are the pointing words like this and that and here and there and some of the what are called modals which are things like might and could and should and would and these are closed classes. I mean, you could you could waste a lot of neuron power trying to coin a new preposition. I mean, good luck with that. Because the prepositions, there's about 150 prepositions in the English language. And, um, and so why do we have these closed classes? And why do we have the open classes? Uh, and is that, a, is that a fundamental property of these uh, sequential systems? And the argument that I make is yes, 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 this is the case. That in fact, even, at the, uh, even in the cell, you find this, that you find genes which are um, quite malleable. You can create new genes pretty much without limit. But there are also uh, what you might think of as the prepositions and so forth of the, uh, of the genetic system that are fixed. And some of these are the codons. Some of these are, you know, when, when the DNA is being transcribed, where does it stop? It has to be a stopping point. So there are things like that that are that are quite universal throughout the uh, throughout the genetic system that really correspond to these kind of open and closed classes. So I think I think it is a fundamental property of of sequence systems, and I think it has to do with our ability to project in space and time some of these uh, some of these affordances and some of these opportunities for uh, for interaction because if you think about animal communication you mentioned vervet monkeys before so vervet monkeys have alarm calls that they uh, that they use to uh, to warn of of predation from leopards or or eagles or snakes but they have no way of talking about the probability of there being a snake or maybe there'll be a snake tomorrow, or maybe there's a snake on the other side of the hill. These are things that we can do because we can talk about might 
and we can talk about over the hill and we can talk about in a couple of days. So we've got prepositions like in and over and we've got modals like might that allow us to take the affordances that we have in the here and now and we can we can expand them, extend them into the future and put conditions on them and and so on and so forth. And that really gives us a huge amount of power and flexibility in 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 what we can talk about and what we can do. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. And I think what I really found interesting is this pattern, two cases of it, and I thought about it further, I found a third case, which is this idea of having a coherent core and then a flexible domain around it. Uh, that may actually be very important for developing an expressive sequence language, kind of like the idea of the error catastrophe and getting over DNA. If the core is not stable enough, uh, as if you know, prepositions came and went, the ability to bootstrap sophisticated artifacts and language would become very difficult. While the fact that nouns come and go, I mean, it's, it's always a fun thing. You see these articles in the Atlantic or something. Here are a hundred nouns that still exist in the Oxford Dictionary, but I guarantee you've never heard, right? <laughs> right, right. And so it, perhaps there's something significant about this balance between core and the application layer, you know, the kernel and the application, as we'd say, in, uh, in operating systems. Yeah, I think, I think there's a way of, uh, of thinking about that in terms of our culture as well, because, you know, all of us are, are, are born into cultures and we tend to, you know, we acquire a language, for example, we acquire the language that, of the culture that we are, that we're born into, and we acquire folk ways and we acquire all kinds of cultural behaviors and norms that uh, that help to uh, that help to guide our behavior, but within that, then there are there's a lot of diversity. So while you may have a, an assembly line worker, and you may have a farmer, and you may have a an engineer, and you may have a computer scientist, and you may have a lawyer, these people may all come out of the same culture, and they may all use the same basic core of language, and they may all share a set of cultural norms and values, they also have these very specialized languages and these very specialized uh, things that they're able to perceive in the world that, that, are, that are unique to them or unique to their profession. So again, you've got a core and you've got to maintain that core and then build upon it. Yeah, I think that's very interesting and an important design principle for at least certain kinds of design and the, you know, our work on the, the game B world of uh, social operating system from the future. This was my third example. We call it coherent pluralism in that, you know, we have found from history that highly coherent systems generally turn into nightmares like Stalinism or Nazism, right? While radical pluralism ends up not being able to build very much anarchy, essentially. And so there's some middle ground, don't know where it is, of coherent pluralism, where there's a set of principles, which all agree to, and yet any group of people can build lots of things around those, however they see fit. And that seems to fit this model very nicely. Well, you you tend to you see this interestingly. You see this at the uh, at the microbial level, the field of 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 horizontal gene transfer, which has become quite uh, quite prominent. I think largely due to the work of Carl Woese and and others, is the idea that now now we're talking about bacteria. And you know, we're talking about the genes that uh, that help to run a, a a bacteria like E. coli, which is the standard laboratory uh, uh, bacterium, or something like a, a Prochlorococcus, which is a, a cyanobacterium that is probably responsible for as much photosynthesis as any other organism on the planet. It lives out in the oceans. And these organisms at this level have the ability to exchange bits of DNA among each other. So we normally think of inheriting DNA as something that passes from parent to offspring. But in this case, little bits of DNA are shuffled among these organisms in real time and often in response to perturbations in their environment. One, one good example of this is this is how uh, drug resistance travels in populations of bacteria. So if a gene evolves in such a way to confer a drug resistance on the bacterium, that can actually be transmitted in real time to other members of the population as opposed to waiting to pass it down to the next generation. However, the what we find with these uh, with these organisms is that 
they may only have, uh, for the sake of argument, 5,000 genes in their genomes, but of those 5,000, maybe only half are going to be found in all members of the species. So they have their own core genome, similar to what we've been talking about. They have a core genome, in this case, of, if we say 5,000 genes in all, of maybe 2,500 genes that are found everywhere. And the other 2,500 come from other places and are used for other things. And if you add them all up, a species like E. coli or a Prochlorococcus, even more so, Pro Chlorococcus, I think, has a core genome of about 2,000 genes, but the total number of genes that have been found across all of them may be as high as 80,000. So in other words, this enormous storehouse of genes out in the world that are available to be shared. And it's, it's, it's almost like thinking about, you know, you need a lawyer, call a lawyer, you need a gene, the gene you need is over there and, and, and another, uh, another, another cell will share it with you. So if there's a gene that helps a prochlorococcus survive better in a low light situation and, and it gets darker or they move down in the water column, then they can share that gene that helps them. And so this is done in real time as opposed to having to wait for reproduction production to take place to pass it down to subsequent generations. But this, this phenomenon of having a core that is shared by everybody and then having all of this variation around the core, I think is, uh, it, it appears in many guises. Interesting. Yeah. Though a side note, when I was reading that, I said, hmm, you know, it's kind of interesting. However, this prokaryotic style of horizontal gene transmission is really effective at local adaptation, as you point out, you know, okay, I, you know, the water's turned more saline. Well, it turns out there's a gene floating around in the soup that coming through my membrane from time to time, mostly I ignore it, but at the moment I need that sucker. So let's replicate it. Right. Or it turns out the chemistry causes it to replicate. On the other hand, because there isn't stability, there's less self-referential ability within a prokaryotic genetic ecosystem than there is in a eukaryotic ecosystem where the genes are, are duplicated as a package. So perhaps that's why, while the prokaryotes, the uh, archaea and the uh, bacteria, are remarkably adaptive into every niche imaginable, they don't generate much complexity. Because the genetic machinery they chose to use, or they got locked into more precisely, does not have the long-range self-referentialness of the eukaryotic cells, which have allowed the eukaryotic cell to be open-ended to build this uh, hierarchical complexity that we talked about. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, the, uh, the, the advent of, of multicellularity and how you build a multicellular organism uh, from a from a single cell zygote is is totally dependent on this uh, self referential property and the ability to uh, to uh, to organize into these these hierarchies these gene regulatory networks that are responsible for building out the body plan during development and that kind of thing. Of course, that came a little bit later. You know, we got the eukaryotes first, which yes. used a different method of uh, duplication of the genetic material, generated it in toto rather than in you know, bits and pieces at a time. And that the math for that is what enabled this long range self-referentialness, which then discovered the great trick, which is, you know, because there's several kinds of multicellularity that were invented, but only one has been decisive. And that was the one that led to the Cambrian explosion in which essentially all the body plans, all the phyla on earth today came into existence uh, with one minor exception uh, during something like five or 10 million years, about 500 million years ago. And it's, you know, again, one of those interesting scratch your head Fermi paradox questions. How hard was that? Yeah, I know you were you were talking to Doug Irwin about that, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And that, uh, yeah. Correct. We had Doug Irwin on and we dug deep into the Cambrian explosion, one of my uh, favorite topics, right? Yeah, well, he 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 worked with uh, with some of the folks who were very involved in uh, in developing these uh, these theories of gene regulatory networks and how they and how they cohere and and are essentially passed down as a as a functional unit. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, famously, the ones that the Fox genes that uh, is that the one that, that lays out the body plan. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can have uh, in theory insects with fifteen modules instead of the three that we get because they happen to be set to three, right? And the number of arms that you have and the length of your torso—they're all 
set by these you know, essentially recursive calling of uh, the same structural program with different parameters. Yeah. How many segments do you, how many segments would you like? <laughs> yeah. Essentially, uh, genetics invented the subroutine call with a parameter, right? <laughs> yep. Pretty yep. goddamn clever, old ma nature, ain't she? <laughs> Let's now bump up a little bit to a level, one higher level of abstractions. One of the, one of the points you make early in the book is that while you're going to talk about specific instantiations, in this case, DNA-based genetics and human language, particularly written language, uh, in theory, your model could apply to any sequential systems that have these attributes. Well, yes. I mean, what I'm trying to do in the book is to is to figure out what's uh, you know what is what is necessary versus what is true but not important. And uh, and that's that's one of the things that you that you get at as you're uh, as you're as you're trying to compare something that 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 where people have thought there are two separate things. People have thought, well, there's the genetics and there's the language, and and my argument is that these are really two facets of one thing or two different examples of one thing, which is the uh, the systems of sequences. So the real question is, as as you say, is are there other possible sequential substrates that could exist and if there were how would they function and i and my argument would be that uh, that ultimately you need some mechanism for the sequence because they are energetically inert for the sequence to interact with the world and you need some kind of a an interactor and this goes back to uh, to david hull who you quoted at the very beginning of the podcast david hull really came up with the idea of an interactor as, as kind of a reaction to, to Richard Dawkins, actually. Richard Dawkins uh, in The Selfish Gene talked about replicator, replicator, replicator. Well, we understand now replicators are, they're inert. They don't function in the world without having some kind of a mechanism for getting to the world. Um, and so it was, uh, it was Hull who came up with the idea of an interactor as being the thing that engages with the world. And the interactor has to have two pieces. One is some kind of a perceptual mechanism and some sort of a behavioral mechanism. In other words, it has to it has to see something and do something, essentially. And an enzyme is probably the simplest example of that because an enzyme can recognize another molecule and it's very specific in the kind of molecule that it will recognize. And then it performs some molecular manipulation on that other molecule uh, to, uh, to push metabolism forward. So the idea of, of perceiving something and then having a very specific reaction, behavioral reaction to that is, is, is what interactors do. So any system that has sequences has to have, uh, has to have these interactors to engage with the world. And of course, the interactors also help to build the, the mechanisms that that interpret and uh, and replicate the sequences so so that's how you get this this bootstrap effect and you get the uh, you get the uh, the building of these uh, evolutionarily open-ended uh, systems yeah it's interesting because you talk about three classes of sequences so you don't really get it much into the third and the, th- and the third being uh, computer code. And if we think about, you know, the search for artificial general intelligence as an example of where computer code might be able to transcend things like human language, right? Could cre- could create mechanisms of communicating which are cognitively gated by our relative stupidity. You know, humans are to the first order of the stupidest possible general intelligence. You know, my nature is seldom profligate with her gifts. We're the first to cross the line in our evolutionary tree. So the chance of us being very far over the line is small. And we know from cognitive science, there's lots of obvious bottlenecks like Miller's famous seven plus or minus two working memory size, which fundamentally distorts our language, for instance, right? That's why phrases are short. The distance between uh, pauses in language is seldom more than seven words. It's also why there's uh, seldom more than three levels of recursion, even though Chomsky claims universal language is infinitely recursive. He's actually wrong. It's not. Uh, It's basically three levels of recursion and occasionally somebody in a maniacal academic text might go to four. Uh, but if it goes to five, even the PhDs will be scratching their heads. Yeah. No good editor would let that happen. <laughs> yeah. And if we read, particularly if we read some uh, uh, humanities journal today, you go, what the fuck? Right? <laughs> what does that actually mean, if anything? But anyway, so my point is that in your land of code and, but most importantly, with also sensors and effectors, because this is, again, this is what I forgot to ask earlier. It's a simple grounding problem. 
which is bedeviled artificial general intelligence research, in my opinion, but is forced to be confronted in robots. Yeah, and, and, and I would predict that the artificial general intelligence will continue to be befuddled by this problem more or less indefinitely. The, um, the difference between, between a code, because we know that computer code has many of the attributes of human language, written language, uh, not speech so much, but uh, certainly it's got an alphabet, it's got a hierarchical structuring, it gains meaning as you put these uh, as you put these ones and zeros together. Many of many of those same attributes exist there. It's it's uh, rate independent. If you put a faster processor in the computer, the code will run faster, but it doesn't change the output. All those same attributes. However, the thing that that code does not have is it does not have a built-in semantics, and uh, and I think that gets to uh, Stephen Harnad's simple grounding problem, and the psychologist L. S. Vygotsky actually had a had a phrase that I like a lot, which is he he calls it deliberate semantics. In other words, when you're dealing with robots, you're dealing with a the the imposition of semantics on on code, and and that's uh, that's evolutionarily um, backwards because the fact is that our language evolved in an animal that already had a fairly advanced perceptual and motor behavioral system. So the uh, perceptual things, the effectors, the sensors, all of these things were already in existence when we developed language. And so the language is very much connected to the world through us in a way that code that is written de novo is not and th- this this came out it was it was interesting because because i you know i'm i'm a big fan of enzymes and some authors uh, wrote a book about the history of of the study of enzymes that they called nature's robots and that was a uh, that was a uh, a metaphor that other people have used uh, that the enzymes in the cell are running around like little robots and and uh, and i have to question that metaphor because when you think of a robot in modern technology a robot has a has a set of of sensors and a set of effectors they may you know cut weld whatever it may be they may have some vision they may have some hearing they may have some some proprio-centric things and then they have this then they have a computer in between so they they sense things those uh Percepts are converted into code. They're processed, and then the output, is, you know, connects to the effectors, and the effectors go and do something in the world. That's how a robot works. Enzymes aren't like that, though. Enzymes don't have a computer. Enzymes are strictly mechanical devices that are actually able to perceive things and actually able to manipulate other things at the molecular level but there is no uh there's no computer in between the uh, the input and the output and so the question that i ask is you know when we think about cognition is the brain more like an enzyme or is it more like a robot in other words are we thinking about something that is largely a dynamical system or something that is much more of an information processing system or is it some hybrid of both yeah. and i think the current thinking is of course it's some of both of course uh, now i will say that there are people who to my view at least have gone too far into the information processing model and you know you can sort of see the dead end in AI and the so-called good old fashioned AI where we thought uh, people, they thought people could get to AGI via, you know, writing down enough logical statements, right? The so-called expert systems model. Mm-hmm. And that ran out of gas. Turns out the world's way higher dimensionality than the ability for any human to write down enough if then statements or uh, prologue statements to, to model it. And of course, now we're in this very interesting world that seems more biological, so-called machine learning, where rather than being told what to do, deep neural nets and other closely related technologies are given large amounts of data and they essentially program themselves based on data. And there's of course, similar things in robotics where robots can learn how to navigate an environment from doing it. Now, unfortunately, there's still a gap. 
in that the amount of data necessary to do machine learning is way larger than it is for humans. Humans can learn on a relatively small a number of examples. So human cognition, at least this is the Ruttian view for what it's worth, is that it combines some of both in our perceptual systems and our ability to create things like objects uh, in our mind are very much like machine learning in that they're uh, self-organization related to uh, that's in response to stimuli from the external environment. However, our cognition is at least in part driven by something sort of like the symbolic in that we're able to manipulate high level objects and get inferences between them and probability, at least often implicit probability assumptions about things without having to have millions and millions of examples, you know, famously, uh, Alpha Zero learned to play chess by itself, but it took 100 million games uh, before it got very good. A seven-year-old you can teach to play chess, and by their fifth game, they're sort of okay, right? Uh, and that, that's qualitatively different. And so, yeah, I think I think the the distinction that you have to make with a lot of these machine learning systems too is the um, is the fact that the inputs that they're given are all sequences. In other words, you're feeding them sequences and they're figuring out the world from the sequences rather than how we evolved, which is we figured out the world by moving around in it and and most of us dying off before we got to where we are. Yeah, of course, we get the interesting new phenomena like the self-driving car, right? Uh, I mean, this is right at the edge. Uh, and part of what self-driving cars do is learning from their environment. Now, it turns out it's too dangerous, too expensive, let them loose on the roads. But Google in particular has spent a vast amount of what its Waymo subsidiary building a simulated world, apparently at a uh, relatively high level of detail. And their Waymo AIs have gotten much of their learning from interacting with simulated uh, humans, because they have, obviously have to have lots of simulated humans in there too, driving cars around to interact with, and have learned from the environment, quote unquote. And then once they get out on the road, if they're at least I would hope that they also have uh, learning modules built in and even better, they can share their learning with each other. Unlike humans, humans share our learning, but very slowly through things like textbooks, things like self-driving cars could share their learning in near real time, which uh, gets us kind of closer to a, a more biological model. Well, this, this is very reminiscent of the work that was actually being done, I think, at uh, at SFI back in the 90s. Was it Chris Langdon who was doing all the artificial, yeah, yeah. A-life, artificial life where we are trying to simulate evolution in a in a completely silicon based environment. Yep, it's uh, very interesting out there. Well, anything else you want to talk about? I got a few other things on my list, but frankly, we hit all the high parts astoundingly in ninety minutes in a book of astounding depth. And I would, uh, you know, again, those of you who found this conversation interesting, I would definitely go and get that book. It's easy reading. I'm trying to look for my notes where the goddamn title is. Uh, let me tell you, Jim. Yeah, let me uh, yeah, let the <laughs> author give us the title. It's uh, Behavior and Culture in One Dimension, Sequences, Affordances, and the Evolution of Complexity, published by Rutledge. Yeah, and you don't need to know nothing to read it, right? That's the amazing <laughs> thing about it. That's where I think he did such a fine job. Any final thoughts you want to uh, leave our audience with here? Well, I guess the uh, you know there's 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 a lot in here, and I would just say that the um, that the opportunity to write a book that's that's this interdisciplinary was a real gift to me, and I'm hoping that uh, that uh, that many of the fields that it touches upon will uh, will find it useful, including linguistics and evolutionary theory, philosophy of biology, uh, cognitive science, complexity science so forth. Well, thank you, Dennis Waters, for a wonderful and very enjoyable, at least on my part, conversation. It has been terrific talking with you, Jim. Thanks for having me. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.